skills and whatnot, go over a little bit of nuts and bolts. What I am is a uh, property manager, okay? Um, I run my rental superstore. Uh, we manage a bunch of rentals for a lot of different people and whatnot. Um, in the course of time, in doing a lot of different deals and coming across a lot of different things, I've been flipping. Um, I've acted as a realtor. I'm a designated broker of uh, our company and whatnot. So all these different things, all I want to do is try to open up the playbook, give you more tools to find deals other than having to knock on the next door neighbor, go through mom, and this, that, and the other, okay? So we start there, and then we try to start adding in different ways for you to make some commissions, okay? That's because that's what it's all about, right? We want to go and make some sales commissions as agents. Okay, so let's jump into this, because uh, usually this class is about an hour, and I'm going to run you down to 45 minutes, so let's, uh, let's do it, okay? So a couple things you need to know. All right, and this is strictly let, let's let's categorize it what it is. All right, we have our we have our regular buyers, and then we have investors and so on and so forth. But really, what we need to do is, as we are going to approach that second level person who's buying, not just buying to move in, we need to start thinking and trying to use a little bit of our cognitive resources. Is what if I was investing? What if I'm buying and whatnot? And if you practice this and whatnot, this will help you to open up and look for different ways, different opportunities that are out there. Because it is always about opportunity, all right? Always contemplate, evaluate, relate, initiate, all right? Contemplate, think about it. Think about what you're trying to accomplish always. Evaluate, try to evaluate. Hey, does it make sense? Does a condo in Glendale for $1.5 million and it's a one bedroom, two bath in a crack neighborhood, does that make sense? No, it doesn't make any sense. So we want to constantly go evaluate, does it make sense? I mean, there's always that surface look, but then we'll look a little bit below that, okay? Relate, always make, make things relatable to people, okay? I used to use, I use a little story where I'm like, hey, look, you can buy one house and move into it, right? But if you bought a house and you bought the house next door, let's say you bought the house next door, and let's say you just rented it out for 18 years, okay? For 18 years, you rented it out, you collected rents and everything like that. Two things will probably happen. One, you're gonna definitely pay the house down, right? Two, very likely that it's gonna go up, all right? What am I gonna relate that to? What is 18 years out that starts for me on July 8th? Kids? Tuition. Tuition, thank you. College tuition, okay? So something like that that's just relatable to your, to your buyer, going like, hey, if you just pick up one rental property, think about it. You could possibly pay off your kid's tuition if you did something very simple like that. A very relatable story. Okay, always relating when you're talking to them. When you when you're looking in this um, uh, era or this aura, this region of um, investment property. Okay, and then initiate. You know, ask the question, broach the subject. Have you thought about a rental property? Have you thought about a second one? Have you thought about what you're going to do? What's your goal and whatnot? Start them down the path. Now you're all going. We're all so always sowing seeds, right? We're always going out, talking to people, and sowing seeds, and coming up with different ways and whatnot, and looking for more sales, this is another way to open it up, okay? I, I always say, everyone is an investor in training. They just don't know it yet, okay? As an agent, as you start to build up the things that you see and whatnot, you start to bring this added value, and you offer that to the client, and give them an opportunity to get some more property. What is that for you? Sales. Right? So that's what we're ultimately trying to do. We're trying to earn our commission, but we also are adding some value back in. Okay? So that's what we do with this when we initiate this. Alright? And I'm gonna go over some of these some of these little nuts and bolts for for some of you in the class of what we're looking for and whatnot. I always started with that. And then we'll get into how we're gonna find those deals. Alright, price, always a big thing. Right now price is crazy because people are just paying ridiculous amounts for stuff. So we're looking for price. In a normal market, we can start to, it, it, it makes a little bit more sense to where we're looking for the right prices, or is the value gonna be there and whatnot. Right now, we might have to stretch a little bit because you got people with just oodles of cash that are just you know throwing it out there, okay? You still look at that price. Location, always big, right? We know this, location, location, location. Condition, condition's a big thing, okay? You're gonna find people, a couple, couple different um, uh, types of, of first time rental buyers, the condition that they want to have something that's new, brand new, it's going to work out really well for them and whatnot, they're not going to have a lot of repairs, that's something to consider, okay? Then you have the, your others where 
they are, hey, can I value add a little something to it? Is it a fixer up or whatnot? If you can find somebody like that, then that condition, again, comes into play. Is it, does it just need what we call lipstick and rouge, meaning a little coat of paint, maybe some tile, stuff like it, or does it need a major overhaul with that, okay? So consider our condition. How much maintenance is it gonna cost, all right? When we go into, whenever I evaluate a deal, I'm always going in thinking, do I have a water heater that's over 10 years old? Does the roof look like it's got a few years out? Just looking at that property, and you know, anybody can do it. It's not, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. Just look, what do my eyes tell me? Do I have a condition of the property such as, I got laminate flooring, not vinyl, not the vinyl stuff, not the laminate that we call now that they click it, but I'm talking the roll out laminate stuff. Do I have something like that that is now obsolete? Okay, so look at that. Monthly costs. When you look at rentals and whatnot, one of the things you always do is look at monthly cost. Biggest thing is usually always the mortgage, okay? But then if you have utilities, if you have management, if you've got landscaping, um, different things like that. Do you have solar on the property that may cost another, be a monthly cost, right? Always evaluating what's that monthly cost gonna be, okay, whenever I'm looking for a deal. And then when I am, the ultimately, when I do look for a deal, the number one thing, the most important thing, how much is the income gonna be on it, okay? On a rental, very important. What's that income gonna be? Because then I can go back to my monthly cost of my maintenance and go, can I, can I factor all this in on top of the mortgage? How much meat is there there, there okay? What I call, we call that really that monthly cost is, is your nut, your monthly nut. How much is that monthly nut gonna be over and over again? Is my income greater than that? It is, am, do I have a buyer who's financially doing really well that if they gotta take a negative, they're okay with that? Okay, I don't ever advise that, but that's just my strategy, all right? But look at that income, because if you can help break that down, it just demonstrates a little bit more ability. Find that for them, okay? All right. There's a little bit more of how they all work together. You know, square footage, lot size, number of units uh, for your price, how many bedrooms per unit. Let me talk about this really quick. If you guys ever, if you guys do, like let's say you start buying stuff for yourself, all right? Try to buy and you go for income properties. I have a lot of fourplexes and triplexes in my portfolio. I'm always looking for something that's two bedrooms or greater. One bedroom's okay, two bedrooms are better. They're just a lot easier to, to rent out, okay? Try to stay away from efficiency units and studios. If, if somebody offers you a deal downtown and it's, hey, we can rent all these things out and they're all studios, it can work. You, be, you better be a very sophisticated um, you better be a very sophisticated investor if you're gonna make that happen because you're gonna have a ton of turnover. That's, what's, that's what efficiency units will do. People come and go, come and go. They could be higher end, they might be right next to ASU. Okay, that, make, that might make sense. They might be perfect spot of downtown, they could make sense, but in a lot of times, if you're picking up a, a building that's all studios, <laughs> it's gonna be a lot of work. It's gonna be a lot of problems, okay? So that income's gonna go down because you have that fluctuation, right? Um, when I am looking at, at my price, do I have room to add on? Do I get land with it? Okay. And then uh, another thing you're always looking at is comparables, and that's, you know, see what see it's worth. All right. Location, real quick, city. Everybody knows different cities uh, around the uh, Phoenix area. Some cities are, are a little more difficult to work with. Some are very easy. I got a lot of property in Glendale. Glendale's very easy to work with. Utility prices are very low there. Okay. So... The, uh, the water garbage sewer um, in Glendale is always going to be cheaper than it is in Phoenix. And it just works out that way. Keep an eye on that. Um, what amenities do you have in your location? Parks, freeways, shopping, all that other stuff. And then do you have potential changes that are good or bad? Maybe buy it out in Buckeye and Microsoft's going to end up building out there and hey, maybe that's going to work for you. All right? Keep that in mind. All right? When you're looking at deals and whatnot as you're going forward and trying to evaluate and find things, what are potential things that could be value add? Like, what's going to happen with the Metro Center at this point? Are they going to leave it there? Are they going to tear it down? Are they going to rebuild and put something out there? Keep your ear to the ground. Always listening, trying to find out. Is there a place that can possibly make sense for my uh, potential buyer? Okay. So that's what we do with uh, when we're looking at location. Okay. All right. When you look at a condition of the property, we'll touch on this really quick. All right. Um, Exterior, straightforward. Make sure it's not falling down. Make sure you don't have T111 that's falling off the side, looking for stucco cracks and things like that. Um, does it need to be painted? 
do you have exposed fascia, et cetera, et cetera. All right, very straightforward. Interior, same thing. When you're looking at interior and whatnot, though, taking a look at the at the fixtures and whatnot, do you have do you have functional obsolescence? Do you have walls that need to be moved and things like that? But if you're looking for a rental for somebody or a investment property for someone, first timer and whatnot, maybe they're going to want to have something where the interior is it's nice, it's put together. It may not be new. It may be ninety style. It's nice. It's clean. It'll work for a rental. Okay. So keep that in mind. Uh, you know, purple pink, green paint and whatnot, you might need to paint that, all right? Very uniform, very clean is what we're looking for. Electric, if you ever go back to an electric box and whatnot and you see these circular dials back there, that's gonna be a problem, okay? Because that's old wiring and whatnot. You could have a lot of potential issues. You open up the box and look at how they look out on new houses when you're out there and every day, stuff, something built in 2010, 2015, you see a box, real nice looking, okay, that's good. You see some stuff built in the 80s and whatnot, you open them up, they're a little smaller. Those are usually work. You want to ask if it's got, or check to see if it has aluminum wiring in your home inspection and whatnot. That can be a little bit of an issue, but not that bad. Um, look at that for electric. Just use your eye test. Everything intact and whatnot. But look at that box. Does it look like it's awfully small? Does it look like there's a there's a major problem there? All right. Uh, AC units. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on with AC units and whatnot. Um, you know, depending on on what you what you run into, uh, I wouldn't advise you know I wouldn't advise anything more than maybe 10, 12 years out. You can get a lot of years with it if you in your inspection and whatnot. But if you see the old clunker up there, or you see a uh, a uh, um, evap cooler up there, mm, that's going to be expense for you. Okay, might want to step over that one or build it into the cost. Okay, sometimes that can be an opportunity. Now think about it this way: on the flip side of that, you see a bunch of these things. Not now, because everyone's crazy and what they're paying for stuff. But in other times of the market, that's an opportunity to negotiate it down. See, or maybe see if, this, if the seller will pay and redo some of that stuff to make the sale happen. All right, roof. Roof, real quick, I, composite's great and whatnot. When you're looking at the composite roof and, and whatnot, if you see it kind of, how do I explain it? If it starts it's looking like it's kind of sticky up there, like just it's looking sticky, then you know it's starting to go, okay? Looks clean and whatnot, driving neighbor, you can see one, but you see it kind of, it, it almost looks like it's starting to peel off a little bit. You're starting to, you're starting to run into that five-year window where it's going to have to be replaced. Okay, so keep that in. You get the tile running across the top and sides, and it's probably going to need to be replaced. They don't redo them that way, although one of my neighbors did um, anymore, but that'll, that'll be an indicator that that's something you want to do. Appliances and whatnot, very easy to, to whatever. Common area costs, all right? Um, when you have, if you're looking at multi-units, all right? So you've got an investor, they start looking for, hey, I want to find a triplex, a fourplex, etc. Does it have a lot of lawn? Does it have a lot of trees? Does it have other amenities that are gonna cost you a lot on a monthly basis to keep up? Something to keep in mind. Is it desert gravel? Does it have very low maintenance in there? Can I just basically throw some ground clear and everything else? That's a little low, lower maintenance, but keep that in mind, all right? Does the common area is gonna have extra costs that may come in, um, in involved with it. And that goes on to landscaping and irrigation, etc. Um, the laundry facility, if there is a laundry facility in there, is it coin operated? Is it, work, is it uh, operable by somebody else? Is there an opportunity there to add one in? Okay, keep that in mind. Flooring, um, when you look at rentals, it, it depends on the scale and whatnot. Carpet is never, never a, um, optimum in smaller units and whatnot, apartment complexes. You can have them all tiled out, which is much easier. If it's a, you know, nice two bed or three bedroom, two bath house, somewhere here in Scottsdale, Chandler, four bedroom, something like that, eh, carpet in the bedrooms, that's nice. Darker carpets though. You don't want to have darker carpets because those lighter ones are bad. Windows, you got your dual pane, you know, you got single pane and stuff like that. Single pane are actually kind of in a way, they're a little bit better for units and whatnot because if they break, they're a lot easier to replace and fix. Um, if you've got a you know, nice house and whatnot, yeah, you're gonna probably want to have dual pane windows in there and whatnot. So keep that in mind. Also, you know, there are a lot of places around the area um, that you can find some good deals on windows and whatnot, not just buying them from the Home Depot and whatnot. So, good uh, good opportunities there. All right, maintenance and monthly costs. Uh, a little more in depth on this. Um, Again, you've got your utilities. When you have multi-units and whatnot, keep this in mind, you will have utilities that will be uh, paid for by the owner. Usually it's water, garbage, and sewer. Okay? 
okay? Don't ever pay for electrical and gas for the tenants, all right? And if it's in a single family, don't pay for any of them, all right? Push them off to the tenants and whatnot. But if you do have a common area utility, then keep that in mind, all right? That's a monthly cost. Landscaping went over, leaks and whatnot, those can those can occur again in the in the inspection. You're checking for that stuff with plumbing and whatnot, um, broken fixtures, uh, different things that that will come up and whatnot on a monthly basis. Uh, plumbing upkeep. One of the things that I, rec I recommend most most of my people now when they're evaluating a building, if it's older, always get your plumber to go down there and uh, just camera the line. Most home inspectors won't, but if it is, I would say using my rule of thumb now is about. 90, about 90 year before, I'm going to camera down and maybe even a little a little newer than that. But just camera down it, it especially if you get something back in the 70s, 60s and whatnot, you're really checking out for clay and cast iron that's down underneath there. That's going to have to be replaced at some point with some ABS, all right? So just, I recommend always looking at that because that can be something big. Every AC is tuned up once a year, all right? Always a good thing to do. Management. Uh, management's going to be a monthly cost that's going to come in. You love guys like me, like me we do it for 8% a month. 8, 8 to 10 is roughly where full service management will be. Uh, you will have your renter's warehouse and a few other people that will do it for 75, but then you'll end up why you're, you'll understand why they're doing it for 75 very shortly. Um, that, that'll, that'll come in and you'll, you'll find your good and bad managers everywhere. Roof and paint, um, roof we talked about, painting, very straightforward and whatnot. If you got some storage units, if you got storage that go along with the property, sometimes that can be an opportunity to increase rents and things like that. So that might be an opportunity there. Um, and then if you've got a parking lot, let's say let's say you find an investor and he buys a, a home from you, and then he buys another, and then he buys a duplex and a triplex. Then he comes back to you and goes, "Hey, I want a I want a 16 unit. Great, you find it for him. It's got a big parking lot and whatnot. Take a look at it. That that becomes something that could be a cost down the road if it's pretty beat up and whatnot." So that's something to keep in mind. If it's got um, carports, are those carports rusted and things like that? Something to, something to just think about. Laundry and vending, bigger prop complexes and whatnot, but more opportunity to add value into a property, okay? All right, a penny saved is a penny earned, but a penny spent can bring more dollars than saved pennies. It's like the old ad, you, gotta, you, gotta, you gotta spend money to make money, okay? Um, when you go into stuff, and this is what I've been seeing lately in rentals, okay? I have noticed a lot that as we're starting to see more houses fixed up and, and uh, remodeled and whatnot, I'm starting to see that gap starting to raise a little bit in the differential and what we can get for something nice versus something that's eh, kind of okay. All right, that is starting. We're starting to see that right now in rentals. So when um, when your your customers are coming through and whatnot, yeah, now might be the time to go. Hey, it might be a good idea to add in something, whether it's paint some cabinets, swap out those laminate countertops and put in granite, change the appliances to stainless steel, do those little things. It's starting to become something that will garner a little bit more in rent because rent, if any of you have done any kind of rentals or anything lately, you'll know that the competition is just fierce. If it's put out at the right price, we're getting multiple, multiple offers or multiple applications, sorry, to rent out some of our houses. So. That, that differential, and, and a lot of our owners, you know, they want to maximize their money. I always do, but the thing is, is every owner's, owner's different. So if they can make that little extra investment, they can make that money, that, that money grow faster by putting together a better rental. And sometimes just a little bit of this, a coat of paint, like I said, the appliances, different things that you can do to make that thing uh, get you a little bit more money, okay? All right, 20 minutes. Woo. You're good. You're going to get a drink real quick here because now we go, I think we're now going into, yep, let's talk about habits and stuff like that. All right, so let's talk about what you're here for. Let's find some deals, all right? So first things first, guys. Um, I don't know what they told you in real estate school or anything like that, but remember, going back to this is a daily habit, daily grind job, all right? Sometimes it can be easy. Sometimes there are big commissions. Most of your money is made not when you're making that sale and everything, but it's in the grinding out, okay? Day in, day out, going in there. This is a contact sport, okay? So the more contact sport you do, the more emails you send out, the more times you spend looking through searches and whatnot, the money is there, all right? It's very much one of these, one of these businesses where it's hard to make $50,000 and easy to make $200,000, okay? 
because what happens is is you build it right my theory has always been this i'm not just going to be an agent that sells homes and, and buy and buys homes for people i'm going to try to see where can i make money in any single avenue that i can real estate's beautiful from that because there's so many different ways that you can earn commissions and make money but we have to do all the little things on a month on a daily basis okay so let's uh let's go through some of these things okay mls searches all right you guys all know how to do mls searches if you don't go to armless get a class there and whatnot there's a lot of different ways you can do it but the thing is is with these searches there are so many different ways that you can set it up all right um for residential the first thing that they tell you look at the hot sheet well i say look at the hot sheet but customize it okay you can customize the hot sheet to start looking for things for you on a daily basis what's coming out okay stay on it stay on it. hot sheet what's my hot sheet what am i really looking for am i looking for condos am i looking for townhomes am i looking for single family homes am i looking for multi okay use that hot sheet old listings go to old listing look for things and search for things that have been on the market for more than you know 90 days 100 days and stuff like that either one or two things has happened either the guy is sometimes you got stubborn sellers that are like if i don't get two million dollars from a property i'm not selling it yeah, fine whatever you can you can find out from the agent other times they finally get tired they get worn down they get beat up but they haven't had anybody calling for a long time you can make that call okay so look for old listings expired listings okay i'm not going to tell you to do expired listings and call and see if you can get a listing other people will tell you to do that and yes you can actually do that call them and see if they're still interested in selling okay sometimes listings will expire maybe sometimes you've got a buyer and something will fit but look at expired listings pull some of those up Get to learn who the brokers are around town, okay? Um, my home is a little tough because it's big and so is like Coldwell Banker and stuff like that. But you will, find, you will find other little power brokers that are out there that are selling specific things, okay? Um, I'll tell you one. SJ Fowler, they sell a lot of multifamily, okay? See him nodding over there? They sell a lot of multifamily. Check out who, who the people are there that they have listed and whatnot. Find out some of the names. Keep an eye on that. Okay, see if you can forge a relationship with some of those agents and whatnot so you can hopefully maybe get a heads up before something's coming out. Okay, those are the things that you got to do. This is very much a relationship business. We're, we're competing for commissions, but we're working together. The more agents and whatnot that you know, that know you, that know that you have, that you just call them. Okay, they're not going to call you, but call them. There's no shame in it. Hey, I'm new to the business and whatnot. I see that you do a lot of transactions and whatnot. I got a buyer who's looking for this. Can I, is there any way I can get on an early list? Don't, hey, if one of them's a jerk, don't be discouraged by it, okay? There, we have some of those in this business, but there are a lot of people that are open to it. There are a lot of good people in this business that will listen, oh, okay, cool. Remember though, you gotta touch in, you gotta touch bases with them. You gotta, a text, an email, hey, still out there, still looking. I get, I get random texts all the time. I'm not even sure who these guys are, but if, if the right time it comes about, I'm like, yeah, I've got this. Okay, so just touch up, touch up, touch up. All right, in the multifamily and whatnot, do your searches, fourplex, triplex, duplex, those are what I really focus on for me, but it's because that fits my game plan. Okay, my game, my game plan is multifamily, um, you know, usually two to three, two to three bedrooms. They, when, when I rent these out and whatnot, I get a higher ROI. You know, we know what ROI is? Return, return, return on, on investment. investment, okay? You hear cap rate thrown out a lot, I, I'm more concerned with what's my ROI? What's the return on my investment on a monthly basis? On a single family home, in general, versus a duplex, triplex, fourplex, I'm not gonna get as high of a return. Now, I may get a better equity appreciation out of that single family home, but that multifamily is what works for me because I, work for, I like cash flow. I like to have that money coming in on a monthly basis. That's what works for me. Okay, these units and the other reason I mentioned them is because up to four units you can still qualify for residential financial financing. Okay, uh, when you go above that and you go into commercial realm, mm -hmm. completely changes everything. Okay, so keep that in mind. All right, um, look at gross rents when you're doing searches for for multifamilies. All right, search for gross rents, see what you can find. High gross rents, hey, eh? it's a good thing. But also look through the expenses and whatnot. High expenses. One one little tip I'll tell you right now because this has tripped me up before in the past. 
if and when the time ever comes that you look for a fourplex or triplex for one of your investors, make sure there's not an HOA there. Or if there is, build it into your cost. You get, you get caught on one of those HOAs one time, you better figure out before that bins period ends or you're like, oh crap. I had one one time with a broker. We went in there, we did our inspection and everything and then all of a sudden I'm like, hey, what's this about the HOA? Um, 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 I'm like, you guys didn't list that. So I was able to use it to get my buyer out and whatnot, but just keep that in mind. If there's an HOA, that's gonna be an added expense. And then it's, do they cover water? Sometimes they will. If they don't, now you're really, you know, you can be in a bind there. But keep that in mind. In the back of your mind, just forget, remember, Jason told me one thing about fourplexes, triplexes, duplexes. Is there an HOA there? Because that HOA sometimes can be expensive and not worth it, okay? Multi-property multi searches, properties <laughs> bundled together sometimes. So do a multi-dwelling, multi okay? Do a multi-property, multi sorry. Look there to see if somebody's selling, you know, four or five units at once, all right? Eventually, people can get desperate and they'll break it off. But look, do the time, do the searches and whatnot, all right? Uh, owner may think they need to sell them all together. That's not true, all right? It could be, but usually it's not true. And then if it's long days on the mar market, then they're going to start to want to listen, okay? So we're going to look at some of those things. All right, let's get beyond this. All right, wholesalers. All right, anybody deal with any wholesalers right now? Yeah? All right. Let me give my, let me give my number one about wholesalers. I love wholesalers. I've worked with a bunch of them. If you get a wholesale deal come across your board, first thing you want to do right now, go check the MLS and see if it's listed. <laughs> Go check the MLS and see if it's listed. And a lot of times these wholesalers are, it's gone from this guy to this guy to this guy. Okay? That's that's the bad. The good of it, these guys do find some deals. Okay? They never know, you know, they don't care. They're they're making they're making their little margin. Here you go. Go. There may be some margin for negotiation or something like that. But these guys, you definitely want to get to know them. All right? Start looking around. Keegley, I think they're I think they're here and whatnot. Yeah, Keegley's here, yep. so Wholesale warehouse. We'll get into yep. that in a little bit. We'll yeah. talk about wholesale. Business. This guy's going to talk about all this stuff, but that's the thing. Get to know some of the wholesalers and whatnot. All right. Establish your connection. All right. Hard money lenders. All right. I'm sure he's going to have a little bit more to talk about that too. But do get to know several different hard money lenders, and, and let me tell you why. All right. When when you're when you guys want to get into um, when they want to get into buying something, they got to move quickly on these wholesale deals. You're going to need some hard money to get it done. All right. They can quick close. They, uh, they'll fund really fast. Um, you know, sometimes they can lend based on ARV. Does anybody know what ARV is? After repair value. After repair value, good man, right? And guys, when he says they buy cash, when people say that they're buying cash, you hear that all in the market right now, you're usually just, they're just getting a different style of loan. It's just yep. a, a private loan rather than going the national route. So. Yeah. And um, yeah, so anyway, uh, when, you, when you get to know these guys and whatnot, uh, again, lower down payments in certain scenarios, fix up funds. Here's the big thing, okay? And this is what I found has worked for me all the time. Big takeaway from, from my portion of it is sometimes my hard money lenders, they get returns, okay? They go foreclose on somebody. And guess what? You make a call to them that day, they may have some returns. They get a return, they just want to get it back out. Mm -hmm. They take their inventory back out, they've made their mark, they're like, here, take it, go, go finish, finish the deal. That's where you can find some deals, okay? But you gotta make you gotta make calls. That's what it all comes down to: is calls, emails, texts, and just touching with the different professionals that are out there. All right, I've taken down a couple of good deals on returns. Guy runs out of money. Guy started framing the inside. Done. I'm like, well, hell, he left me half the materials. Yeah, I'll take it. I'll finish it up. Okay. So that's something that can be there as you start to find your investors if they're sophisticated enough. That is a great market for you right there. So ask about their inventory and whatnot, all right? Another thing that you may find, you're gonna, you're gonna talk to some of your hard money lenders and people that have ideas. Guess what they have? Other people have the same ideas that they may not have enough cash. So sometimes you can partner up, come together on a deal, okay? You gotta ask the questions though. You gotta ask the questions of the hard money lenders. Hey, do you know anybody else? Hey, sometimes they may not, but it never hurts to ask that question. Okay? And ask that of everybody. You know anybody else who's looking to get together on a deal? If you can connect a couple of dots, you may forge a, you could forge a partnership and just be the agent for them. That'd be great. Okay? But all it is is connecting those dots. Okay? All right. 
Another, another uh, a source that, I'll fi that I've found is personal bankers, and I'll tell you why. I used to be a personal banker at Chase. I did it for, oh, I did it for about 18 months, okay? Uh, I, used to do, I used to do loans in California, and I had a, I had a mortgage company over there back in, uh, before the big crash in, in 07, 08, right? And we were all making money hands over fist, and it was awesome. Well, after 08, they came in, and I had one lender after another walk into our doors going, countrywide lender. Can't lend anymore. All loans suspended. See you later. He walks out. World Savings Lender walks in. All loans suspended. We're done. Can't do it. On and on and on. And all of a sudden, it just went. And I'm like, we can't make money anymore. It was a lot younger in my career. I was about 31. And didn't know where to go at that point. So I was like, I'm going to go to Arizona for a while. Go figure it out down there. Got a job at Chase Bank. And it was like being on vacation. I actually, I'm working 40 hours a week. Walking in, just talking to customers. The thing is, is I didn't have any contacts. But guess what I did have? A lot of people that walked in the bank asking me about a bunch of different stuff. And all I was waiting for was people to come tell me, hey, I, I didn't have any realtors, I didn't have any, any lenders, I didn't know anybody. And all I needed was one guy to walk in the bank. And you know what he did? He walked in the bank, the guy didn't work out, but he took me somewhere else, and I ended up in this room with all these people that, they wanted to be investors, they just didn't know how, okay? And, they were, and there was this company, and I won't even name it, but anyway, they were giving seminars, and they're like, we're selling education. And I'm like, yeah, I'm not paying for education. I'm like, that's not why I'm here. I'm like, I'm a, I'm a lender at, at Chase Bank, but that's not really why I'm here. I was there to just meet people and network. Started networking and whatnot, and all of a sudden, connection, connection, connection. I was like, okay, Chase, I'll see you later. Got my real estate license. I was like, okay, I'm ready to get back in now. And started back on my path. But the thing is, is that one thing that I knew in knowing all the other bankers at, at Chase and whatnot, they all had a ton of customers and didn't know what to do with them. Most of them, they can't, they can't uh, fund the loan for them because it was very hard, very strict on what they could do, okay? Most of them have no idea of any realtors, like well, a handful here and there, but they didn't know any realtors around. So they were just looking to meet people. So bankers became, they become a very good source because they are a public direct hand-to-hand -hand comment all the time. What do you have to do to, to meet a banker? Walk in the bank. Just walk in there. If you don't have a personal banker right now, get to know one. Okay, get to know their lender. Get to know the branch manager and whatnot because they are always looking for other people to, to, to work through. Now, they may have somebody, all right, whatever, walk into the next branch, right? But these people have people coming in to do their, do their work daily, daily. So something is always coming up. So if you can get an email and just Plant the seed, just be there. If you can do that and start getting these different people, then you can find these deals, okay? Um, you wanna constantly, be, they're, they're constantly looking for resources, like I said, ready, ready available and huge reach. All right, another one, attorneys, all right? If you guys don't know any probate attorneys, if you guys don't know any real estate attorneys or anything like that, get to know a few of them, all right? Especially if they're newer to the business and whatnot. They are going to come across a lot of different stuff. If you can get, if you can find yourself a probate attorney, uh, that is a great deal because you know, unfortunately, there is one thing that none of us are going to get away from, and that is passing away. Unfortunately, but when that when that happens, they do need somebody to step in and be the realtor and whatnot. And it is just, it's an opportunity. Okay, it's not the only opportunity, but things happen. And and one of the things that happens a lot of times is, it's not even that. It's the probate attorney passes it to the, the son and the daughter. And what happens? Six months in, the son and the daughter are like, no, no, I want to rent it. No, I want to sell it. Need somebody to do it. Okay? Opportunity there to step in. Maybe it's an opportunity to bring your investor over and go, hey, let's pick one off there. Or even for yourself. Okay? So probate attorneys do that. Um, they're public direct. They also deal in divorce. And, you know, what is it, 50, 60% of the time? That's what's going to happen. They need somebody to go and list the property and whatnot. They just have things that are gonna happen, okay? So I would recommend always talking to them. They also do consolidation, okay? So they will consolidate things for their clients and whatnot, all right? One of the things is, is with clients that have debt, all right? One of the things that we know about with people that have debt is they have a lot of debt and they've got several different ways or a few ways that they can get out but one of the biggest ways they can get out is doing something with the house house or selling it off or doing or whatever okay they'll try to refinance but if that doesn't work they got to sell it 
right? Because they just get in trouble with debt. That's what we do as consumers in the United States is we get we get a little bit of money. Pandemic happens, we're all saving up. Pandemic end, ends, what are we gonna do? Spend, 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 spend. Some people don't know how to budget. That's not that's not my fault. It just it happens. But the thing is, as an agent, when that happens and they need to sell, who better than you to be the person that's gonna sell for them? Okay? Sometimes they have to make sometimes things have to happen quickly too. Sometimes it's an opportunity to go in and go, hey, well, I'll give you an offer. Can't be not gonna be full price, but I can close in five days, and you can be done with this opportunity. Okay? So attorneys, got a good one there. All right, Craigslist. Not a great one that much anymore. I leave it in here because every now and again, you know, you can be panning down the river and a nugget of gold will show up. It still happens. All right, it still happens. People post stuff up there. Um, FISBO, for a sale by owner. Owners that are like, hey, I'm gonna cut the, cut the agents out. It happens. They're out there. People do get desperate and whatnot, but you can find some stuff there, all right? If it, I wouldn't recommend spending all day on Craigslist. Five minutes here and there. Check it out and go through that. Again, all these different things that I'm talking about are just a way of putting it in your tool belt going like, can I go back to all these different references and can I start mining it out? Because that's ultimately what we want to do is go through, look for it, look for it, okay? Um, another thing, Google, Yahoo, and Facebook market, Marketplace, all right? Same kind of thing. You're seeing stuff that's getting marketed out there, all right? Wholesale properties, FISBO, um, houses for sale, deals on homes, lease to own. Lease to own is another interesting one and whatnot because it was uh, it was a technique used long ago where you would lease the property, give somebody a price, and they had to buy it from you in five years. In that five-year time period, if you you know, if for whatever reason they didn't buy it, you get it got to revert back to you. You would lease it to them at slightly higher than market value. So, I rent it. I normal rent would be a thousand bucks, but I'm renting you for twelve hundred. The two hundred dollars on top, I'm gonna go ahead and credit that to your down payment. And then five years from now, you'll have whatever's accumulated. We have a strike price. You buy it for me. If you don't buy it, guess what? I get the I get the property back. Right? There's still people trying to do that. And when I, it's out there. So lease to own can be another opportunity that's that's out there. Um, when I when I really uh, look at it again, the Fizbos, you will find some people that are out there on that. Um, again, I use I use uh, you know use those searches for wholesale properties, things like that. Anything that you can think of, you, know, you got to get the get the mind, the juices flowing and whatnot. Do some searches and whatnot. Search through there. Okay, it's all of these little things that if you do on a daily basis, trust me, you will make money. You will find deals doing this. It's just a matter of remembering. Hey, I gotta do this. I've gotta budget my time in there, all right? I need an hour for that every day. I need to commit to an hour every day to do this, all right? To my regular regular things that I like to do to prospect and everything, but can I get an hour? Can I get 30 minutes to do a couple searches, see if there's something there? And can I be diligent enough to understand that right now, it's going to be 10% hit rate, 5% hit rate. It's going to be a lot of, a lot of time, okay? But that's the thing. You can find the time. You can always find the time if you'll just go in there, budget it, and find it. Make it all work for you because it, it, it's there. You just have to spend the time going through it, okay? All right, man, I actually did pretty good on time. All right, real quick, and then I'm going to turn this thing over to, to Nate over here. Uh, my Rental Superstore, that's the name of my company, okay? First and foremost, I get an office at the top of the uh, the top of the um, staircase. I'm rarely here. Usually I'm downtown, our office is on uh, 16th Ave and Roosevelt. And um, me and my team, we manage properties. I personally though, get involved in all kinds of different stuff. Like I said, there's flips, there's, uh, you know, uh, buy and hold, there's all kinds of different things that I, that I do. There are a million different deals that come across my desk. The majority of them are not great right now, but they are there. So I am there as a resource for you. If you need to talk something through, especially when it comes to, will this property rent and how much, how much can I expect? How much can I tell my owner this will rent for? I'm your guy. Text me, let me know. I got a couple of agents that text me daily. What will this rent for? I think it'll go for this much, okay? Always use me for that resource. Hey, is this a good neighborhood for a rental? Hmm, I can tell you right off the top of my, off the top, uh, 
you know, what are the cross streets? Yes, yeah, that'll be good. No, that won't be good. Okay, um, doesn't always work that way, but for the most part, I've driven all over the valley, so I've got a pretty good handle on it right now. If not, I've got guys that go as far east as, uh, what is it, Tor, uh, Torteso? Tor, Tortesso? It's like 301st Street in Buckeye. And another guy that goes not quite to Florence, but all the way deep in Santan Valley. Okay, AJ, we know that place and everything as well. So we're there to help you with that resource. Another thing, uh, landlord tenant stuff comes up, okay? In the times of this, you're gonna have clients that are gonna be like, hey, I've got this monster situation. You know what happens when, when it go, somebody sends that into Andrew Glenn, the designated broker here? Guess who the first person is he calls? <laughs> Jason, what do we do here? I'm like, yeah, just send him over. Send him over, let me diagnose it. Let me open up my tool belt, let me open up my playbook, and let me see if I can figure out what the problem is, okay? Um, I'm here for you for that. That's my, that's my giveaway, is to be there for you guys for all that stuff. All the tough questions that deal with all that stuff, you know, please do not hesitate to reach out. If you need a property manager, that's where I come in. Hey, we'll take it for it, we'll take it. 8% um, monthly fee, we do a 4% listing fee. That's basically the renting out portion of it. Um, online portals, 24 access, 4 7 access. We do direct deposits to the owners. Everything's electronic and whatnot. The one thing that I can tell you that I can guarantee you though, is if you send them to me as an agent, they're going back to you for the sale. Okay, I'm not gonna poach them for you and whatnot, I just manage them for you. They go back for you, okay? You will have you will have me and my team there, and the big and the most important thing, you're not gonna send it somewhere where it's not where they're not gonna get taken care of. Okay, because I will pick up the phone, I will make sure my guys are getting the deal done because I don't want you to look bad. I want you to be comfortable going like, hey, we sent it to somebody that's taking care of it and your client's happy. Because there is nothing worse than sending it to a bad referral partner. They don't get the job done, then it makes you look terrible. Okay, so that's the that's the thing for us. Um, I got some cards and whatnot, guys, that I will hand out. If you got any questions, please don't hesitate. Email, call, text me. Let me know what's going on. I will do anything I can to help. All right. Cool. Thank any you, any quick questions right now? How many doors you got? Four hundred that we manage. But me me personally, I have twenty seven. Mm -hmm. so twenty seven. Like yeah, I mean I took my own notes on what he said <laughs> right. today. It's like difference of being yeah. production, right? You're yeah. doing all different ways to be productive within real estate. That's awesome. That's yeah. 400 doors. Yeah, that's what we're that at. We're awesome. trying to keep going, guys. All right, let me hand out some cards. And I'll turn this over to Nick. Nick, do you want to plug in right here? Yeah, I'll snap that from there real okay. quick. Switch over. Hey guys, I'm Nick. I am a uh, managing partner for My Agent Offers, so we're going to go into the, the cash offer system that Jeremy Martin and our team has put together for you, taking some of these phenomenal ideas uh, that uh, Jason has come up with and give you guys some different ways to be successful within that. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for Yeah, please. This is going really good to see you, man. I'm glad one of the classes. <laughs> there we go. Nice job. All right, guys. So as Jason kind of went over uh, a lot of different strategies to talk about, my agent offers, cash offers, Phoenix market, and how to stay within this market and prospect within it. We're all agents. We'll talk a little bit about market. We'll kind of go through this. We've been through my class and we kind of do this every time. But 2021. This is my ninth year in real estate. I have seen one buyer's market. It was in 2014 for about six months. <laughs> um, where we are right now is a challenge to be would to say it. I'm just to be honest with you. It's a challenging seller's market. There's not a ton of listings. Hard to come about them. He gave you endless amounts of ways to continuously look for those opportunities, right? And we want to help those capitalize on those for you. Jeremy Mark and the My Home Group team has come together with this. This is a little off, I think, by the angle. Oh, is it the? If you want to plug in and use this thing, I appreciate that. Yeah. I'll try to take this size down a little bit, but let's see if I can get this to fit properly on this screen. I'm a little off on the size, but currently, guys, right now, sitting around 4,399 <coughs> listings, Phoenix Metro across the market. This top blue line up here is 2017. Um, you can't see it, but I can see it just the way the angle is. There was 18,000 listings at that time. So a drop, uh, 
significant drop, right? Uh, so we've seen less and less houses on the market. Uh, I do a ton of analytics. I study just overall demographics, markets for appreciation, work on that side. This is your Cromford Index. Um, Crawford Index, we've all heard of it, seen it, look at it. I study it regularly. I love uh, listening to what they do on a regular basis and comparable to see where we're going. Um, market Index, if I was talking to you all right now, and if I was to tell you that our market peak was actually March 11th, would you be shocked to hear that? It's true. We actually hit the most demand and most least amount of inventory at the same time, March 11th. Our Crawford Index was 514 at that time. Currently, Sitting at right here, 491, right? So in the last, this was on March 11th, the 514. Today is April 14th, so in 30 days, you've had a drop, the total index to 491, right, a drop. Now, where is that drop coming from? It's not from supply. Supply has stayed where it's at, has been this way. I have watched it for the last five years go in the same direction. Less supply, less supply. We've actually kind of flatlined um, this number over here for this left side is 22.2, 22.3. So we've moved up 0.1 in the last 30 days. So do, do, you, do we actually see that in the Phoenix market? No, not really. It's, it's a blip, right? Um, but where are we seeing the drop? It's actually in demand, less and less demand. Not significant enough to really show anything. Um, why would we have less demand, you guys think? Discouraged. discouraged because of pricing. Pricing goes up. Yeah, it's discouraging. Competition, right? Even if the price is high, if it's listed right, 15, 16, 17 offers. I got way more appraisal. Like, I've done this for a long time. I haven't worked as a buyer's agent for a couple of years, right? I don't write tons of contracts, but had a friend ask me, help him, right? Going out showing houses. What's it take to get him an offer? Get him something accepted. Canceling appraisal, right? Non-refundable earnest deposit. Like stuff that I would not in my truthful self not normally recommend to people, right? You don't feel right about that. Um, but times, condition, where we are currently, be aggressive. They need a house. Real estate's a great investment to counter inflation, right? It's a hold for inflation. We can talk about that here in a second. But that's where we've kind of seen our challenges. Overall index. 2002, woo, interesting. Little, little scary, interesting part right there. Um, scary, I can tell you also, this looks scary to a lot of people. Some people capitalized huge right here and did really, really well if you knew what you were doing, right? For every gain, there is a loss, and every loss, there is a gain. We are way down here over at the other end. As you guys can kind of see, that 511 was a couple weeks ago. Demand kind of coming down to that normal spot, right? Look at supply. Since I've known it, since I've known it, really kind of just going down. I've been watching this since they've been coming out with it. The supply has kind of always come down. So this is where we're at right now, currently. So we still have a gap. But if you want to know about the market, it's basic economic principles, supply and demand, right? How much supply you have and how much demand you have indicates price. If supply is not there and demand is still there, prices will increase. If supply is there, and demand is not there, prices will depreciate. What that would show is, Crawford always calls it 100. 100, and if they're both at, both at 100, that would consider flat. No appreciation, no depreciation. I bought my house for $100, sell it for $100, because we're at an even supply, even demand, flat market. They would need to be right here. We actually had it happen. Remember I said we had a buyer's market back in 2014? There it was. <laughs> right there. Uh, it lasted for a little bit. But that was when we actually had some really good negotiations, right? It actually brought buyer power. You could get concessions. You could make things work because you had the advantage. Sellers took back hold and have had leverage and, and had the power since then. Now, what supply and demand always wants to do is be together. You hear her talk about that all the time. They want to come together. They want to be together. It shows a real indication of value with supply at a 22.3, that is a minus 78.3%. That's actually how I think about it, is the percentages. This has not shown tons of indication of changing. This is showing indications of changing, right? Mm -hmm. Now, as this maybe drops, maybe we get other people thinking about coming onto the market, right? But 
with that as well, what's very different, and I'm going to talk about Phoenix, specifically Phoenix, what's very different about Phoenix back here to where we are right now? Everybody's moving to Phoenix. Population growth. Absolutely. Uh, why would people move here, just out of curiosity? Uh, because the coronavirus proved that many people can work from home, and what is a better place than to come to Arizona, where we have super low cost of living? To cost of living is driving. So she mentioned something. Uh, well, I, I'll hit on corona just very slightly. Psychology is a huge driver in anything. Does anyone, I'm just, you don't have to accept it, but if, if any of anyone lived in a one bedroom, when I was first getting into the business, so we're back here. I lived in a one bedroom, one bath, 625 square place with my girlfriend at the time. She is now my wife. I don't know how we made it through that. <laughs> but we lived in a 625 foot square place. I do not think we would have made it through there if you would have quarantined me in there for 12 months, right? So what does that tell you in psychology of who you are? The place that you live can be the most prized possession, even way greater than it was. Because I need a place to raise my head. I need a place. So in Phoenix, what else has also happened in this time? Population growth, population growth, diversity, large companies come here. I love studying what things happen here. I am hoping if it came out in the Arizona Business Journal today, it's my, I hope it happens. We will be the semiconductor capital of the United States. Taiwan Semiconductor, one of the largest companies in the entire world, is building a $20 billion plant North Phoenix. Does anyone hear about it? Not so much because it's just getting off the ground. They're going to bring 3,000 jobs here. Every one of those jobs will make a million dollars. Taiwan Semiconductor. Yeah, so they, they make, we, are, we can go into different stuff, but semiconducting chips is in a uh, shortage across the world right now. So Arizona has been looked at, especially in the United States, a place for Intel, Taiwan Semiconductor, to build massive plants to bring high-end jobs here, engineering jobs, not hospitality jobs. I love hospitality, that's what I came from. I came up in restaurants, did that, been there. But an engineer and a restaurant manager probably make a little different, right? With that growth, with those companies, with all of that, appreciation, 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 appreciation. Then you have coronavirus hit. Psychology of how important is it for me to live in a house place to hang out, place to be, place I can spend and work from, right? So now what has become the thing that everyone wants if you live in Phoenix? Single family home, three, two, pool, right? How hard are those to find right now? Like they're just not really there. So competition for all of this is tough. We have conversations, but then with all of this going on, you have competition. Right? We have how many agents in Phoenix? I, I can tell you, I, I think it's around 78,000 from what I remember. And I saw something from Karen Nguyen, um, huge, great, great woman, if you don't know Karen, but runs a great team, Southwest Valley. Um, she said that uh, of the 60 or 70,000 people that are licensed realtors, only uh, 40,000 of those did not do four transactions. So there's really only the 25 that are really putting in the work, right? Oh, and by the way, Homie is here. If you don't know, Phoenix is also the real estate technology capital of the world. Everything is tested here. Everything is brought here. Everything is figured out here due to demographics, scalability, size, grid metrics. You can really study how people respond to things. Zillow Offers is here. Offerpad is here. Open Door is here. Open Door is next to my house. I see their damn sign all the time. Um, when I was in that buyer's market, I was like, man, I, I've always wanted to be the listing agent, right? Be the number one listing agent in the Valley. It's been one of my goals kind of skewed off of that since then. Then in 2015, I lost the deal to Open Door. I was like, okay, interesting. Next year, I lost seven deals to Open Door. I'm like, what is exactly going on? Studied it, figured it out, and their process is streamlined, convenience, ease of move, right? Uh, and that is their goal. Well, my home group wants to compete with them on this level. Did we have sound? There we go. Sorry. Some sound, maybe. Maybe. Well, maybe. Sorry, guys. 
we'll skip past that part. The goal is that within Jeremy, Mark, the entire My Home, uh Group brokerage has brought in My Agent Offers, a way for you to have a cash offer system, an ability to bring cash offers to any client that you would like to have the conversation, to again, promote and find out what is the best strategy for your clients in order to capitalize on them. Jason gave you lots of different ways to capitalize them. This is built in to put you at the table, to get, make sure that you stay relative. And because I have some marketing money, Jason's got 400 doors. I'm sure he's got some marketing money, right? He can advertise, he can put it out there. You know who has a lot of that marketing money? Wall Street. Wall Street invests in a lot of these big companies and we see it on every single ad, radio, television. So they're putting out all these ads and you have to compete with that style. Compete with the, the overall dynamic that someone's willing to buy my house directly from me by clicking a button. In that sense, I don't have trust in that. It's a weird thing to kind of do the overall experience, but the reality is that the consumer knows that it's there. The consumer knows that they have buyers almost across the board. Uh, to an extent, so as you relate to people as a trusted advisor, a trusted real estate professional that studies the market, you want to be able to bring at least the multitude of options that they're going to see across the board in one package. And that's you, the licensed, professional, trustworthy, my home group agent that can bring all of that to the table. They're going to hear that they can get an offer from Zillow, but Zillow's not going to list the property. They can hear they can get an offer from OpenPad, but it's going to be their way their system, how they do it, right? Where they don't get to control or have really any idea of how it goes until they go under contract with them. With my agent offers, it is built in to make sure you guys have that support. Me, Jack and Jill. This is why it's Jack important. And Jill. If I don't get these to work, I'm sorry guys. It should play. Let's see if it loads. Let me try this real quick. Sorry guys, never had issues with this. But, well, instead of have problems with it, I'll skip it. Um, the idea with the, I, I made an entire explainer video there that kind of gives you an idea of why it's super important to bring a cash offer to any client that you talk to. Whether it's a conversation at a barbecue, whether it's a conversation over dinner, whether if it is a truly a listing or if it is an investor looking for different opportunities, the ability to say that I have a cash offer system readily available for you to have that in there is extremely important. It brings a more powerful My Home Group agent. It brings multiple options for them so they know that you're the resource for them. It has the opportunity to bring you more transactions, getting a buy side, a cash offer side, and then taking them out to purchase and sell as well, and allows you to compete against those large eye buyers and provide multiple solutions to those sellers. So as you're having conversations with anyone, I'm at this point, I've actually been this way for over two years now, but I'm offering the ability to buy your home directly from you on every single person that I actually get to the conversation. Where it's this casual, I actually, it's exciting to be in front of people again. I kind of like it. And uh, I was actually at a birthday party on Sunday. Friend, what do you guys get asked all the time? Crazy market. How's the market? How's the market? Crazy market. And I tell them, you know, it is crazy. What's it going to take you to get out of your home? I'll buy it cash from you tomorrow. Everyone chuckles, thinks it's a joke. I'm like, no, no, I, I really would like to know what would it take to get you out of your home? And do you have a dollar amount in mind? They're like, oh, million dollars. I'm like, well, where do you live? I got their address, got them a bottom line. I will literally crank out a cash offer for them and send it to them like, I know you said it's a million dollars, but I'll give you 750. What do you think? Move out when you want. The idea of that entire process is not to capture him today. It's to let him know that I have the resources to do it and that I know that he at least thought about it. It's psychology. He thought about it. I sent him a number. I know that it's at least in his mind. It gives me the ability to follow up and show him that I have the resources to capitalize on that. Are you going to be the person buying it? Sometimes some other people can help you put you through that pattern. Not everything is going to be a buy, but being able to produce the offer, at least showing it that it's there is super key because it gives them the option, right? In that cartoon video, which I it kind of shows it to you, we all know open market exposes you to the most buyers, 
therefore gets you the highest price. What you give up from that, a little convenience, you have to negotiate, you also have to let people in your room. There's other things that go into that process, right? If you are not presenting the idea of not just capitalizing on the most money, you're probably not hitting what all of your clients think is what they need out of their process. If you're 85 right now, have health concerns, have anything going on, is money necessarily the thing that you want the most? Maybe not, maybe it's ease and convenience, right? Maybe it's different styles that can match to make sure that you stay competitive because it's not always about top dollar, even though we do know that's what it can really come down to, but it is about just presenting the opportunity for them to know what's different. Now, he touched on a bunch of, Jason hit almost all of these. So we talked about, I bring a cash offer to every single listing appointment I would ever go on. Everyone, no matter what. If it's a $500,000 listing, I bring a cash offer with me, even if it's 410. I'll list, it for, I'll list it for 500, go after the absolute top, top value, or what would you like to list your home for? Because we're kind of at that point, right? I mean, what do you want to list your home for, 550? Okay, we'll sign it, but I can bring you a cash offer and I'll buy it directly from you this way at this number as well. Shows them options, gives them the idea that you have that resource. So therefore, if he does go point and click other places, we still have that built in. Distressed homes, not a ton of those out here anymore. There's not a lot of distress. But I would like to give you an example of why the, the cash offer of my agent offer system can be really impactful for you. Um, I don't know if any of you know Natasha Tomlinson. Um, she works here regularly. Natasha is a good agent, has a good business. She was closing a property and she was one of the first agents that hopped on our classes at the beginning of February. And she was closing a property. And across the street, as she was handing the keys and finishing the process with one client, she saw two people standing in front of a house. The house had caught on fire. Uh, she didn't know what to do with it. It's not really a, anything that she can really do in that situation. She wasn't experienced in that, but she was like, walked over, had a conversation. Hi guys, you know, what's going on over here? What are you guys doing? They're like, well, you know, we're trying to decide on what we can do. We have an insurance claim, right? We have fire, we can't live here. So what can we do? Natasha didn't really have a system built in to kind of handle that. I mean, I did in the beginning of my career, would not know what to do with a fire property. I don't know how many of you feel comfortable handling a fire property. But what she did is she submitted it to the My Agent Offers portal. I was able to kick her out a cash offer for her. And we negotiated with that. We are able to get pretty close. We missed it just slightly. But she created an opportunity out of that to almost capture a deal by just having one conversation. She met someone. Wasn't going to be a resale, wasn't going to be a referral, wasn't going to be anything other than probably an investor cash offer. She put it through. We got really close. We missed it by like $1,500, which is what it come down to. Um, but those are the opportunities that we need. Those are the opportunities we need all of us to continue to capture because where inventory truly is. Post-close possession needs. I had that in the beginning. Now it's become the norm somehow, letting people stay in their homes after they uh, possible. We obviously uh, promote that. We talked about attorneys, probate attorneys. Um, if I was to tell you the best deals don't come from probate, I'd be a little bit of a liar because they do because a lot of times it's easy and convenient. People have family members that are no longer with us, have had other things happen. A lot of times children just want to get rid of the property. So we have the ability to help them through that prospect. Um, I come from for sale by owners. I come from expired listings. I did not grow up here. So when I got into real estate, I made thousands and thousands of calls. I'm probably well into the 30 to 40,000 call range. Probably, not even joking. Um, but when I prospect people, when you have multiple conversations, I am linking cash offers to everything because it's what they hear. It's what they see. So if we're not providing that same solution, I'm bringing it up in every single kind of conversation that I can to hear if it tweaks their interests. Is that is this easy convenience cash offer something you'd be interested in? I can give you cash offer, you can stay as long as you want. Let me know if that would work. Is it gonna end up being the best transaction in that sense? Maybe not, but if you tweak interests, you're now at the table. And that's really the key is being at the table in those situations and being not one of the 70,000, but one of the three people that are gonna have an opportunity to get this transaction. Now, if the other person's offer pad and the other person's open door and it's us, it does become a challenge because of the way they're doing things. But 
you're one in you have a 33 percent chance at that level versus a one in 77 thousand percent. I don't even know what that would be, but it's pretty much zero. So that's the key: is getting yourself into the conversation, creating the idea of linking with someone that has the idea that that could fit them, or if they're just intrigued. I'm intrigued, would you know my cash house would be worth right now because they see these estimates, they see what everyone tells online, they see their neighbors. Would you like to know what your house would be worth right now? Drop, leave your stuff, I will take it as is. Would you like to know what it would be? Like we can definitely do that for them. If I want to, <laughs> I want to buy your home, what is it going to take? Casual conversations for people. That's where I'm at, at stuff. I want to buy your house, what's it going to take? <laughs> like that's stuff just to hear if they have the interest in that style because Again, inventory with where it's at, no one's really in that seller mindset, so we have to go find them. You find them by presenting some marketing material out on social media. We have these created for you as well, and they're going to be sent out to you, but receive cash offers within 24 hours. So what's the My Agent Offer system? Our obligation and our commitment with Jeremy and Mark, and when we came up with the, the, the program last year, was that we'd be able to produce 24-hour offers um, and have them to you directly with a net offer. So the offers that you get back are net. It's You walk away with this, it's flat. They don't pay closing costs, they don't pay commissions, they get this number and they walk away. We do work in our numbers to incorporate that and it does have a commission uh, paid out to the agents as well. And I'll talk about that in just a second. Some other great ones. Receive an all cash offer for your home, 24 hours. If you're not advertising this and your clients aren't seeing it, they are seeing it, it's just not from you, right? They are, they're seeing it, it's just not coming from you. The thing that we offer, and I, it makes me mad that the explainer video is not there, but if you're not presenting all these options, they are going to find them. They're going to see them and they're gonna hit them in the face because like we said at the beginning, Phoenix is the hub. If someone wants to try something real estate really tech related, I didn't even include Rex on there. Anyone heard of Rex? No, Rex companies, discounted brokerages, all these things. Mm -hmm. There are over 30 of them that are all not based in Phoenix, but are tech companies working on ways to sell, buy, do different things with properties. We have to compete with that. That's just where you are, so we need to have all of those solutions available. Here's some basic, simply just basic, take the idea for what it is, Duplicate it, bulk it. I don't really, it doesn't really matter how you do it if you have databases. Remember, I just talked about, I'm using it as a casual conversation. I'm using it as a way to peak psychology. I'm using it as a way just to see what's possible. I get endless amounts of no's. Endless. Like how many no's would you be willing to go through to get a yes? I actually have mine, you know what it is? 265. <laughs> That's how long I will go on calling until I hit it. Like I was like, I will go 250 calls in a row, 250 conversations. If I hear all no, I'll stop for the day because I cannot get someone to go through, but that's how far you can go, right? But this is built in to just create the conversation. Having the conversation, having the ability to present these options to people will at least get you into the mindset of what they're thinking. It's not gonna be today, guys. Most people are not into the idea of selling their house today, tomorrow, probably not even this summer. And if I said it honestly, probably not in 2021. But we know that they're interested in a cash offer. We know they want to know the value today. I'm following up with them consistently different ways to keep track of where they are. It's creating lead flow. It's creating lead generation for yourself. Who has a farm? Who has a farm? Anybody? I have a farm, never given it up, been doing it forever. Um, if you don't have one, definitely talk to your team leads or you're by yourself, talk to myself, Michael Marla, anybody. Have your just where you live, your neighborhood. It could be 50 houses, it could be 50 units if you're in an apartment condo. If they don't know that you're working in the industry, they should. They should get a flyer from you every month, telling them about what's going on in the market and offering them cash offers for their homes. I see the two. My house doesn't sell. I live in South Scottsdale, North Tempe area. No one ever, it's a 1960s community with bad pipes, by the way. So, talking about bad pipes, 15K clay pipe replacement, fun stuff when you invest. 
Um, but I market to every single home in my neighborhood because it doesn't sell. And I just want to be a part of the conversation because one of the worst things that has happened, someone else puts a sign up in your neighborhood, right? And at a price that you don't like because maybe it should have been worth more. But marketing that neighborhood, offering your services as a real estate professional, true, true, like real estate professional is one word, but a true estimate of value, cash offers, listing services, property management services. We have all of those things available for you. Doing that to your same network of people, neighborhood, over and over and over and over again is not only needed, it's an imperative for the next couple years to be consistent with grabbing listings because they're seen on TV, they're seen it on their social media, so you have to double that too. You, where they won't see the difference is they won't, open door can't mail every house. They can't, there's too many houses. So we can at least make the personal connection. He did, if, I, if you want to take anything away what he said, relationships, doors, realtors, lawyers, bankers, mortgage people, anyone you talk to, I'm the resource that can do a lot of different things. I can, you need a rental? Man, I, I don't do any property management, but I know one of the best ones. I can get you to them in two, an hour. We talk to you on the phone, make sure you get, like, you can take nothing. You want to cash off on your own? Oh, I don't, I don't do it but I have that system. You have all of those things together, have to continuously market those for where we are in the market. Process. It is super simple, guys, and I'm tweaking this. I'm going to make it a lot better than what it is right now. Back in uh, of the My Home Group portal, underneath the tabs at the very bottom, we have all of our dashboards. It shows 15 different buttons, whether you're logging into your broker, your par uh, partner marketplace broker. Mint. My agent offers this is right there. You click on that button. It's a simple form. Your name your email address, your phone number is all we want. I have a commitment, we made it to that, and we make it to you right now, that any address that comes through here, we never market to. We never market to the, to the seller, never gonna make a phone call to the seller, never gonna send a mail to the, to the seller, never gonna interact with the seller unless it's through you. So you come in, you put your email address, your name, your phone number, you put the address in, and as Jason was kind of saying, any kind of idea of what property condition in will help us give a better evaluation of the property. Because what we're trying to do is compete with large iBuyers, allow my agent offers to be your resource with what they're doing, right? Um, we do do multiple different ways to try to evaluate properties. And then within 24 hours, you will get a version of that, this offer right here with the address. The offer amount, like I said, which is going to be net, close of escrow date is always TBD, so it's to be determined by you and your commission. So right now, I'm doing it guaranteed 2% of acquisition price. Now again, it's moving entity, so that where if you find deals and it works where there's some other pressures, happy to pay it out wherever it needs to fit if we find deals. So that is the goal, is that you're prospecting, talking to as many people as possible, you put a house through within 24 hours, you get a net offer to the seller, you <laughs> present it. Does that work every time? I told you how many no's I'm willing to go through to get to this. You asked me how many I've done so far. I've written over a thousand evaluations in the last year. I've done 75 just for this program. So we've only captured a couple of them because they're not going to make the most sense for your client. Your client a lot of times we'll want the highest net. We know that if you provide your services, take them to the open market, that's gonna give them the highest net. You have more buyers. But if it's a convenience package where I have a contingency, right? I, that's sometimes we see a lot of that. I cannot get into the next property without being contingent. We can buy, go post possession with them. They wait, they can go up to 60 days and go find their next property. That has been a real convenient thing for some people because the contingency in this market doesn't allow you to win any bids. You're not gonna win that factor. So allows those options. I always think this too, um, with this, we're not in the business of making any of these relationships bad. So if it got to the point where we went under contract and it has to be canceled, we cancel. It's not in the order to steal properties or steal money from people. But if we make a process make sense and you're able to go through with it, allows everyone to cap capitalize on that. I also have it built into Calendly, so if you have just questions about specific properties, you can uh, actually log into Calendly backslash my agent offers, schedule appointments either with me or someone from my team uh, to kind of just talk about the process and go over that. 
some of the questions that we have, and this has changed since I redid this in January. I don't think they're anything really under two hundred thousand dollars these days. So I had it at a hundred. I'm like, oh, of course, but two hundred is pretty much where it's at. And then we're actually at one point two million. So I'll go all the way up to one point two million on evaluation and a purchase price. Um, that's fine. Um, and again, it can be a resource for you. If you're working with someone else and you're just like, I have a chance to flip this, but I want to see where you would be at. I'm not going to say that doesn't happen to me a lot. Where our team runs into full evaluation, they're like, oh, we're just going to take it down. Like, okay, no big deal. Like, you, were we close? Did we have a conversation around? Like, where were you thinking? What am I thinking? I have the same kind of conversation with people as well. We were talking about it earlier. They're like, oh, I'm going to buy this at 725. I'm like, I would never go over 585. Never. All of them is, and they'll have their rhymes and their reasons and their things for doing things. And people that have 10 years, 15 years, the only reason I say that I have a little bit of confidence is that I've done thousands and thousands of them now. Where, where our program works is we're pretty close like to where we think it's going to end up. 97% of the time, it's within 4%. When we follow the full transaction, whether we capture it or not, what our projection ends up hitting is pretty close to what we're going with. So even if it's you just spitballing with someone, want to figure out a different perspective, happy to be that resource for you too. Um, like I said, commission split, we're offering 2%. We paid 3%. I paid 4% because it made more sense for what was going on. Um, and so it's a negotiation, not necessarily a negotiation of trying to be us taking in, but trying to make the best process for you and your clients. How involved do you have to be? Natasha, I brought up that story earlier. Um, if she was able to get that, if we were able to capture that, she would have to be involved 0% of the time. I would have taken that over for her. I would have been the one handling the sellers because she didn't really have a relationship there. Um, but I'd be the one taking that over. But she would still be normal, normal process, normal payout, everything. If it's your client, your aunt, uncle, grandmother moving, and you want to run it from A to B, A to Z, we'll partner with that and like help you through the process. The goal of all of this from brokerage down is efficiency, convenience, solutions for everyone, right? We have to have all of these solutions in place in order to be successful because of where the market is. It's probably going to continue a little bit about that way. Are there any requirements? Kind of talked about that. No, I don't, I don't have any requirements for offers. Um, we process them um, continuously throughout the day. Um, and if you want to reach out, you have a direct email, mao at myhomegroup.com. And then if you want to call, you can. My, I have two cell phones right now because of that. But if you want to call, definitely the easiest way to get a hold of someone would be to schedule the appointment and we can call you back. But if you have an emergency, call it, leave a voicemail. If I do pick up, that would be great. But my phone in, rings endlessly right now because um, it got exposed to real estate. And now everyone puts it into Liberty Law Firm and Lexington Law Firm and all those calls. So. Um, Otherwise, my agent offers is really here for you guys to be a cash offer solution, help you market solutions to different types of clients. Put yourself at the table. Put yourself in as many conversations as that you can have. Barbecues, casual dinners, like I'm that guy because you have to be. You have to be that guy. You have to be the trusted professional because everyone wants to know how the real estate market is doing. It's on fire. I have no idea what on fire means. <laughs> no clue. Like, no clue what on fire means. Like, we have a, I tell people truthfully, I'm like, we have an extreme deficit of supply. So, very limited houses. Does anyone know the number? I look at it, unfortunately, every day. 3,000 single family homes or so, right? What's our population for Phoenix? I know you. Going up. Um, builders. Right? We can talk about builders and where that's at. If you guys know where builders bids again, prices of all materials, inflation, we talked about that, going up. Right? What do you start to see as these big companies starting investing in real estate? Because it's a hedge against inflation. My idea, and this is just me spitballing with you guys, is we're probably going to continue the same direction. That demand blip, I'll actually show you this because it'll make relative good sense for this. Everyone thought the crash, like we talk about real estate values, it was in 2008, but you actually could see this was price appreciation this entire way, all the way till there. 
and then it stopped. When supply hits demand is where you have appreciation stop. It's a pretty big gap. So appreciation is going to continue. It's tough to find investment properties because of competition. So we have to be more competitive in every conversation that we have and present these solutions because that's where it's at. This will probably come up, but we're probably a year, two years away from them getting closer. So as prices continue to increase, you'll start seeing people cash out on their inventory, but not primary residences. That's where we live. You have to upgrade a lot of times. I mean, I'm gonna go this room. Almost everyone's gonna to wanna to upgrade. I wanna go from where I'm at right now to something a little bigger, a little with a pool. I live in a three bedroom or a four bedroom, two bath, 2,200 square foot, no pool. I have two daughters. One's three and the other one's an infant. But in my head, right, where would I like to be? I'd like a four, two with a pool because I can see myself getting quarantined there again in the future, right? Because if that does happen, I'd like to have a pool. I live in Phoenix. I don't have a pool. That sucked not having a pool last year. So that's where my head goes. Single family homes, three twos, big parts of highly populated areas that with growth coming, we see appreciation hitting all of those. Gilbert, Chandler, Norterra, New River. New River is gonna grow. Taiwan Simi is gonna bring some million dollar jobs up there. But it's going to happen, so we're gonna see that growth. And if you really like to see uh, growth, look at our civil engineering. I love to study Rome, history, all this kind of stuff. One of the great philosophers would say, like, if you brought a philosopher from ancient Greece, ancient Rome, to America, what would they be most impressed with? Highway system. The highway system in Phoenix is not only the most impressive thing that we have, it allows you to get from point A to point B in almost 30 minutes if you know where you are. He puts himself in downtown Phoenix probably for a reason. He doesn't come to his office, it probably puts him a little bit farther away from all the things that he needs to do, right? So location, 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 will always drive things, always. But you see the 101, circled Phoenix. 202, circles Gilbert, Southeast Valley. 303, circle in the West Valley. If you want to make a bet, I haven't seen the specifics, but I will almost bet a million dollars that 303 is going to loop all the way around and connect on Fort down. And then you'll start seeing North Scottsdale fill in, right? So that's how the next 20 years will play. You have to be instead of that now, start looking for those investments. Where would you like to invest in? I'll go to New River all day. I will. Because I think about big stuff like that semiconductor stuff. Santan Valley, you give me a little, you know, stretching. We're on the outskirts. Uh, again, bring it in. Rings. I think of everything as a ring. The center is your money. What do you guys think the center of money in Phoenix is? A place. I call it a spot, actually. Camelback Mountain. Most expensive homes, I mean, we can go Silver Leaf up north, but Camelback mm -hmm. Mountains Hub, Biltmore has all the money. Mm -hmm. Everything ring out from there. You can take the center of money right there, and you go out, you stretch it farther, and you can see how Phoenix will grow. So the closer you are to centers is where appreciation will go, because the people that come in with million dollar jobs, they want to live where people with million dollar jobs live. Mm -hmm. That's how all that works. Beverly Hills, you see it in LA, ringed out from the coastline. Malibu is the most expensive rings out, you get farther away. Mm -hmm. So you start finding inner makings. Gilbert has its own center now, right? Didn't used to be like that. Gilbert used to be a farm town. Yeah. Gilbert has a center. Uh, Buckeye, people love Verado, <laughs> love what it is, love what it presents. I'm not gonna argue with it, no big deal. Estrella, different type of living, right? Fountain Hills, its own thing. There are opportunities in all these areas my goal for all of you, especially with these classes and with Jason, solutions, different options, different conversations, relationship building. He talked about wholesaling and kind of this process. Our goal for all of this is to have you guys capture what, what we do on the back end. I have built in a line to be just open to you. I have a line of credit to purchase almost anything. They gave me the right to do. But we also have the ability to kind of distribute to different wholesales if it comes down that route. So that's our goal. The point of it is that you're the person leading it, not it getting snagged up from underneath you, like me losing seven deals to open door in a row. Open door in a row. Like, that's so frustrating. Um, capture it. I, if I would have known what I knew now, I would have bought all seven properties from them directly, held on them for a month or two, and trickled them back on the market, and we've seen that kind of that growth. So my agent offers for you guys, 
is that solution. It's built in to have you guys the ability to have a conversation, even if it just tweaks it. And you want to be like, put it through. One, two, three, Banana Street over in Phoenix. Let me see an ARV. I have no information on the property. We'll get you an ARV on it. We'll get you a cash offer on it for what we think it is. If it doesn't work out, that's not a big deal to us. We want to make sure that you guys are successful. But if it turns into that it's close, we have another conversation, right? We get to continue to work through the process in order to capture that. So my agent offers, guys, brokerage down, solutions for you on every conversation, on every marketing um, is the ultimate goal because that's where we're going to go for, for competition. And if we want to win, which is all I care about doing is winning, um, I want you guys to have those conversations as many times as you can because in order to get listings right now, that's where we're at. So that is my agent offers for you guys. Um, I'm always here as a resource for you. So within that email, within uh, the phone number, within the calendar, mm -hmm. happy to have conversations on ways to utilize the system more. Um, like I said, I'm, again, working <coughs> through a lot of the processes and the kinks as it, as it comes up. But uh, we've seen some great successes. Carl Eisenberg submits so every listing that he goes through just to have the cash offer part of it. He's not into the cash offer investing. That's not part of his tier of business, but he knows he needs it just to have the conversation. Right? J. Brew does all those kind of things, right? Uh, you gotta have the conversation. At least have the solution there because they know that it's there. The client in Phoenix, Metro, Arizona-wise, is more informed than anywhere else. They've been bombarded with real estate information for six years where other parts of the country don't have any idea about any of this stuff. They're seeing some of the trickle downs of it um, and it's gonna get there for them too. But we're the forefront and this type of solution allows you guys to stay there. You guys can stay there, you can compete there, you can win there. And then when we do, and I, I don't you guys get nervous about this by the way, I know it's, it sounds scary, like all these things, bubbles and pops, but it really, if you know, if you have good people around you and you know how to work, you can capitalize on in any style of business, any style. Millionaires, tens of millionaires are made on this side. Tens of millionaires are made on this side. I mean, people that know value, that know these systems, and have the relationships, will continue to push through. So keep saying solutions with, does anyone have any questions? Any like kind of, yeah, sorry. Um, maybe like <coughs> no serious. Um, I was wondering if you have like a list of names of wholesalers because um, it was, maybe I should know this. But no, I, I mean the, the major wholesalers, so if you want to see off market deals that come from wholesales, um, we can talk a little bit about what wholesaling is. Wholesale is someone that's offering a liquid uh, purchase of the property, what they usually do is they get it on a price and they go sell it to someone else on an assignment, exactly. right? The big ones are Keegley, the American Home Sellers, um, through just my home group, um, Housing Solutions is another. Um, there's two others I'm trying to think of who else does it. Um, Bob Herford over here in this office has some good contacts for wholesale, but it's a great question. I can give you some, some more. Mm -hmm. I signed up for all their emails. The reason why I'm asking this is because um, my husband and I just bought a property from my, um, my home group agent, sure. uh, like off the MLS, and it just happened in the my home group. And we saw what he paid for this property, and he told us, yeah, I bought it four months ago from a wholesaler, I was yeah. going to make it a flip, but I need liquid cash. He made over 200,000 off of this deal, and we're willing to pay the price just because we need a bigger home. Yeah. So I was just wondering how people find those wholesale deals, because he said he gets them all the time. He doesn't get them all the time. Well, it depends on who it was well, through. Like, you get like, good ones all the time. You get them, like, I get them all the time. All the like, time, you know, yeah. More proper, proper cash offer, proper cash, yeah. now, cash now homes. A lot of them are not good, yeah. but you have to sift through them and whatnot. So yeah. you get a lot of, you don't get actual deals. You get, Problems. but you have, you have to do the work of sifting through it, figure it out. This is where the analysis comes in going, is this a good deal or not? Yeah. yeah. So like the, the whole, and so, and I'd be like, People find some deals, and that's actually probably a little bit of an issue with the person that he bought it from and him. Because like that sounds like he probably deceived them somehow on his acquisition. 
like on his purchase of that property, since he got it at such a value, it wasn't that you paid $200,000 more, it's that he paid $200,000 less, and that he somehow acquired that property in, in a way. So I, I don't have a quick answer of that particular area, but there is something there with him and what he did. In this particular world, I'm not gonna say I don't see that. Like people just don't know, and they get what better lack of term is taken, um, because he was able to put them under contract for a price that they thought was okay, um, and they actually probably signed it. They, they thought it was fine. He knew it was fine. He bought it. The appreciation that he gained was probably just lack of knowledge, unfortunately, from the yep. seller. I mean, with, with Jason, you agree with that, right? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, so, I, so I'm not going to tell you to go take people for a ride, right? So I'm not going to say that. But how did that guy get that deal? Because he had conversations with random people and made relationships, and then mentioned that he can purchase directly from them and someone happened to be like you know I, I have this house i'd like to sell it i need a cash offer it's not a good and he was like i'll give you 150 for it and he got and the lawyer's like oh sure 150 and he's like oh, and how fast can i sign this contract mm -hmm. sign it they send it back and he's like 350 no problems and in this market part of the differential may be in the last yeah five months house values have shot through the roof you've got people bidding 60 70 120 thousand dollars over over asking so it might not even have been that. He may have just hit it right Perfect. before it really he might have had the right. He might have had the right conversation at a dinner table with the right person, and he said, "How's the market?" And he goes, "It's great. Would you like? I'd like to buy your house from you." And they go, "Well, I've got one." That's yep. literally how that worked, most likely to the to an extent. Like he he made an offer to them when they were looking for one. At least they knew it. He put them under contract, and that's what's happening. I will tell you guys this because I'm being truthful today. Uh, I'm truthful every day. But I, I buy a house in my own neighborhood, like in my own neighborhood from uh, an older couple that I've been trying to buy for over a year. I've been trying to buy it for a year and they finally let me put it under contract. I'm doing it under $100,000 under value. I know that. I've kind of told them that, you know, it's, but the ease of convenience, guess what I've had to sign off on? I pay off, I'm paying all their closing costs, all my closing costs. I'm paying their realtor, even though he wasn't involved at all for the last 12 months, but somehow he's getting paid. Uh, and they're so aggravating. Uh, so aggravating. And they're staying for six months, no fees. That's what it, I was willing to do to buy the house at the value that I'm doing it because I have trust not in what they're doing, but in what I'm doing. I know that I'm getting it. I'm going to give them all this stuff because I know they'll sign it. Am I taking a risk? Yes. Gives me a little small little ting in my belly thinking about it right now, but like... <laughs> That's what I'm willing to do to get this one property. Um, I want you guys to do have conversation with them. Where does it fit? They want four. They wanted four fifty. I got them to four thirty. I'm like, here's four thirty, and they're like, yeah, but we want to stay for six months. I'm like, I'll be back. And I left for like three or four days just to see if it was really what they needed, and they did. And I, here I am. So, you know. And how do they find the hard money lenders? So hard money, it's. I wouldn't expose yourself to this, but you could put it on your Facebook page and see how many people come back to you. Um, but there are private, um, we can have a conversation about private hard money people that will loan. The longer conversation, uh, if it's something that you want to do, uh, there is a certain amount of risk involved in all of this. And so be, I would just say, I would implore you to take, if you start thinking about that style of stuff, implore all types of what you're willing to risk. Like, so on that 430, just because uh, I haven't putting up 86,000 to get it right, I'm willing to lose all 86,000. That's kind of. If you're just looking for some yeah. lenders and whatnot, shoot me an email. I'll yeah, he is going to your resources, oh. but yeah. There's some great. Because, um, yeah. I actually use a paper sale banker, and I had a hard money lender who notarized a whole bunch, like, he notarized 50 deeds every week. Yeah. Like, yeah. that's. And I just. Forgot his name. So I mean, good rate right now. C ten. C ten percent. Oh, you can get ten. I mean, sometimes you can get eight point nine nine, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, somewhere in there. How many points are you going to pay is really important too. Yeah. If you're not paying, you know, three, four points up front. Points are one percent of the purchase price and whatnot. If you can get away with paying, um, you know, little, little to no points. Um, if you're going to move it quickly, a six month, preferable if you can get a year, twelve month deal and whatnot. But that would be the kind of way you want it. Do it if you want to yeah, shoot me an email. I, I'll be willing to tell you a little bit more what I know from that hard money side. Okay. If that's what you're interested in. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah, there's great ways to do financing like yep. hard money, um, 
different solutions. Like we we built in a line of credit, so it's just more of a pull out and push into it. Which is a great solution. Yeah, like, I mean, that's why this is that's yeah. why the cash offer system is here for all of you. Yep. Is because it's a ton of people that are investing in the front side of it to in order to allow us to purchase and allow it to come us by at almost any level. That's the goal. But if for your personal side, some great hard money ideas there. Um, I've been going after sellers lately, so. But the, everything's changing so fast, like just in the last six months, with offers, yeah. these wholesalers. What's been working for them? Because I'm like scrambling, I'm doing flyers, I'm cold calling, I'm mojo, doing all this stuff. What's been working that you've been seeing? There, so I don't want to say I don't, I don't directly know what everyone is doing to work. I see a lot of interesting things going on. I see wholesalers buy stuff off, on MLS. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I'm like, then people kick stuff back to me, and I'm like, I'm not buying it. That it's already listed. Like I'm not even gonna review it because like I'm not even gonna get there are some deals there though. That's what they're doing. I know. What are they doing to win? They're they're talking to as many people as they can, they're offering all the solutions. And then, and then if they find it that it's close. But for marketing wise though. They've got a bunch of they got a bunch of people who don't know anything dialing. Yeah, they, so they dial that. yeah, so that. you you you, you wanna hear that, that's really what it is. They call as many people as they can. Yep. I have four sale by owner dialed, expired dialed, like I told you guys, like, I gotta die. that's a script game, it's a mojo game, it's more of an endurance game and a headache game than anything else, yep. yeah, but right. if I, and if I'm really good at it and I'm on a roll, do you tell me a number, I can look at it in five minutes and go, I'll take it, and they sign it, They're, they put an earnest down, it's, it's refundable, they keep them for 10 days, they try to sell it, if they don't sell it, they cancel the contract, and that's how it works. That's this quick game, yep. it's not a healthy game, it's not a, it's not a long-term game, and it's not a trust game, and it's not going to build a business that's sustainable over time. You're going to have some great deals. You might make 200k. Better save it. That's legal too, right? Because I, I was looking at this one on MLS. When it went past, yeah, like, uh, I, it shows up on Keebly for like 47 grand more. Good. That's what I said. you see that all the time. So that's legal. Your legal. Eye that. That's just just oh. so that's people are that's what lack of better term paper flipping. Yeah. Um, yes. And that's what it is. And so that's more of being a conscious, trusted person. You're an advisor. So a buyer is going to come want to buy that, and like an investor or someone you're helping represent. I tell them what's going on. Like they bought it for approximately this. They're buying it off the open market. This is where it's at. This is where we can project it to be, possibly. If they, you know, a lot of times, if you, this is how you'll know. They'll buy it and in the clause will say, uh, oh, uh, let's just say it's Jason Mendoza and or assignee. Oh. That just gave me the right to assign. Do they even have to put that on there? Well, I don't yeah, they, they don't need it, but title like where you get we're talking about legal semantics. That, like yeah. the, you know, you need to ask about that. Ask John Byron yeah. about that. John will probably tell you exactly. John will tell you you need to have a signee on there because yeah. title's not going to let you transfer exactly. legally. Yeah. But the buyer wouldn't care though. But you may not need to put care. an addendum later or whatnot. But is it legal or not? Uh, yeah, so like the, the legal. Like, the legal. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but the reality is that's what they're doing. They're they're looking for value, knowing value as quickly as possible, locking things under contract and trying to read to sell them. They don't have a buyer. Sometimes they do. Yeah. Um, but other times they don't. If you're um, a listing agent and somebody does that to you, oh, call yeah. them right away and go, no, they did that to me one time. I said, yeah. you better take it down right now. I, you have no right to assign this contract or whatnot, I mean, and yes. market it. You're marketing it illegally. Yeah, yeah so, so this is yeah. yeah. This quick. is also bad. I'm not going to talk bad on everybody. Bad listing agents yep. that do not know what they're doing, that are not savvy enough to even hear this conversation before. So they say, "Oh, we got a cash offer. Did you? <laughs> Did you really? <laughs> right? Like, because that's when I'm like, yeah, cash offer. Never seen the property. I'm hesitant to do a lot of things, yep. but yep. I want to see certain amount of expectations with that. But remember, guys, this is. For, for marketing purposes to build in you to compete with what everyone that you're gonna to talk to is already gonna see. They're gonna know all these things. They're gonna ask you the, the market's on fire. We're having appreciation rapidly. Seeing it. You know how much your house is really worth? I have to say this is always in closing. You know what's really worth? Nothing. Zero. Unless you can sell it. There's no buyers. It's worth nothing. To you, it's worth something, but unless there's another buyer on the other end, because there has been times when you couldn't sell something. Couldn't even get anyone to buy anything. I want, please take it off my hands. No, no buyers. <laughs> it's worth nothing. So when I have conversations with people, no crystal balls, 
Don't have anything. But I will tell you today is your house is worth more now than it ever has been. And unless you cash out, it's worth nothing. Yeah. So selling investments, moving on different, diversifying investments, finding rental investments. I have a big luxury home. So buy three rental properties. Absolutely. Sounds like a great idea. Every time. Every time. Because mm-hmm. that's actually literally what I'm doing. Well, I'm doing it. That's literally what I'm doing. I'm selling my primary residence that I made money on. And I've done really well because I bought it in 2015. So I'm great. I'm going to buy the same house. The same effing house. For $290,000 more than I paid for mine. Okay, it's the same house. It's actually way worse condition now. I'm buying a crappy house for the pool. Uh, so I don't have to change locations. And taking the, all the equity, moving it into that, and then buying two other rental properties at the same time. So I took one investment, I split it into three. Diversified it. That's kind of what you look to have conversations with anyone. You've made a great investment. You hypothetically have made $400,000 or 100% appreciation on your, on your property. Have you ever thought about diversifying? You can take that rental property, break it off, buy three more. Change it up and do different things with it. Conversations, solutions, relationships, opportunities. That's what all of this is about. And if you find anything and you don't feel confident in the evaluation, throw it into my agent offers. We'll kick one back to you in 24 hours. If it works out, great. If it doesn't, you have other solutions for them to see. So. How do you mortgage on like three rentals or two rentals? Like how do I? How do you mortgage it? Yeah, like because you have your primary residence. I'm assuming you're not paying full price for it, or you're not paying it off. So this is what's what's gonna end up happening. I'll just tell, tell you what's gonna end up happening. I'm not selling my house before I buy the other ones either. So I'm actually taking loans on all of them, okay. and then selling it afterwards. So I'm expo- I'm taking a huge gamble and risking market. Yeah. Right now, so if I get if it gets caught, I'm gonna get caught. I'm like I told you, I'm willing to risk the 86, right? So I'm buy I'm taking a certain amount of money to get the hard money loan to go buy the next property, right? So I can go get that. I can close on it, close on it with cash, refinance it, then sell my primary residence after I refinance it as my primary, and then I get that cash back. It's complicated and somewhat risky if it doesn't work out the full full gamut. Um, it, so hypothetically, best case scenario, I buy, loan, close my next property, gut it, renovate it all, refinance it for a higher value than I bought it, which it will, I already know that, and now I'm in into it for 20%, good fee and all that. I get to go now sell my primary residence, close that out, and buy off of that too. So like, the risk would be, Say I don't make somebody the stock market goes up and down, whatever. So like uh, crazy thing goes on summer, there takes interest rates up, buyer market goes away. Now I have no one to buy the house that I currently live in, my primary. And it, the value of that, no one's there to buy it. So I needed all that equity where I think it is right now to help do all this other stuff. I keep losing that the ability to do that unless I can get rid of it. I have built in that, I have written this out and have built in that strategy. So I know what to do if that does happen. So I'm just very meticulous. So like I went through a process, but if it's something you are interested in how, it does get really complicated. Real estate is complicated and all the solutions, but write it out, know what you're willing to risk and all risk, I'm willing to walk away from all of it because I knew that it just, that's part of risk. Like what are you willing to lose? I'm willing to lose this. If you're willing to lose it, it's an investment. Turn it, double it. And that's my goal is to take the 86 and turn it into 400 or so. So 70, you know, 100%, 400% gain is my, is my goal over the next seven to 10 years. But that's kind of what you get into. We can definitely get into those situations. That's multiple steps for that kind of stuff. But for the cash offers and for all of the marketing and stuff, conversations solutions bring all that to the table because it's really needed like right now I'm every bar I'm at if I went to a bar I don't but any bar or restaurant I'm at but it's conversations because people are like you're in real estate it's on fire I like to poke at people is it what do you know about it like and they, they, we just have conversations and then I build in the idea of I buy your house for five hundred thousand dollars I don't have any rhyme or reason behind that but this is the number half a million right in human brain it works Give you half a million dollars for the house. Hmm? Half a million? What's your address? Oh, let me tell you. Perfect. Leave. I have 
done this that style. The reason why I do that is I've done that style for years. It's where my database is built on. That's relationships. It's just continuous. And then over the next, I, easy easy 12 month follow up. For every month on the first, check in on your home sale. See how you're doing. Phone call, text, boom, boom. Continuous forever, over and over. Everyone that responds to my neighborhood flyer, database, once a month, neighborhood flyer, boom, boom. Just does it over and over and over and over and over again. That's how I found my neighbor that I wanted to buy from. He thought about selling, put it on the open market, didn't sell, finally came back to me, I still want to sell. Perfect, it's me and him talking. Just me and him. That's only people involved. Until you got a shitty real estate agent. <laughs> he's involved, he's getting paid, it's ridiculous. But, that, I mean, that's really, it's like it's me and him having a conversation, one, in, one for one. If I didn't get that deal, it would be on me, and it's because it didn't make sense. But it's not me versus the 13 of you. Like, I like my skills, I like my skill set, but it's hard to win against 13 people. But if you're at one and one, you're having the right conversations, you can be one and one, one and two, one and three. Um, when you were presenting, you were talking about it being two years before. Yeah, seen. What was the, what was the two years until you see more inventory? Is that what you were thinking? Two years until you see uh, us, uh, what we'd say, uh, uh, it's not necessarily going to be, I, I honestly, I don't have a principal, I don't know. I'm not, a, I'm not an economist, I, I have an economics degree, studied a lot of this stuff, it's spitballing, right? Uh, the idea that appreciation would stop. Okay. Not necessarily stop, but really kind of be like, we hit value. So where it's somewhere in the next year and a half, you'll have the point where prices can't, like if anyone that's been in it the last two years and that's all they've seen, they've seen what, 15 and then 30? Like crazy. Like I went two, three, four, two, three, four, one down, up and like, it just, it's not possible to do that continuously. So we expect either a flat or a dip. So does that mean supply changes? No. It means demand changed, most likely. I Just the way our population growth is, the way housing is right now, lack of supplies, lack of stuff, hard to foresee all of us selling our houses that we own. I might see me and you do it. You heard me say I'm going to do it, but you're not going to see everyone do it. So it's going to be a limited. So uh, with supply and demand, right, the things that make appreciation happen is the difference between demand and supply, as long as su supply is below demand. Demand's probably going to, as appreciation keeps going, demand can't keep up that pace. I'm not going to, I'd probably, I'd love to buy a million dollar property at some point in my life, but I'm nowhere near that, right? So if the house is in my neighborhood start looking at a million dollars, is that going to drive you to the market to sell? At some point, you will see it. Like investors that do own hundreds, like not, I'm not going to ask because not going to There's a point where he goes, I'm done. There's a point. Like if every well, investor. This uh, is you really the point right now for me. I don't buy anything right now. There you go. Because it's beyond what I want to pay for. And there's too much competition, too much stretching. But that's me. I got 27 over here, so I'm just kind of sitting on this and nurturing this and whatnot. Doors, not actual properties, but doors. But the thing is, is if the right deal comes along, I'm not at the point where I'm 